Hello, Jan. Hello. Well, I'm very, very honored and privileged to have you today. Uh, you are, you and your firm are an inspiration to so many around the world. And I really congratulate you for the amazing, outstanding uh, trajectory you have done uh, and all the great impact you have created on the world. So thank you so, so very much for your time and the presentation you're gonna have. If I may, I will introduce now our distinguished guest, Jan Gell. And I'll give you a few words that I have here in, <clears throat> as an introduction. He's a founding partner of Gell Architects and a professor emeritus of urban design at the School of Architecture Royal Academy in Copenhagen. And he's an honorary fellow of the architectural institutes in Denmark, England, Scotland, Ireland, United States, and Canada. Gail has been awarded the Sir Patrick Abercrombie, Abercrombie Prize for Exemplary Contributions to Town Planning by the International Union of Architects, as well as the key for the city of Sydney, and an honorary doctor degree from Edinburgh, Varna, Halifax, and Toronto. Uh, amazing, speechless uh, from this outstanding trajectory. I wanna get the key of any city. Now I don't have the key from to my house. And so uh, I'm very, very, um, this is incredible. So thank you so, so much. We're excited to have you here and, and to listen to you in this very important day. And so the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Let me try to share the screen. Okay. I'm going to show a little bit about the great confusion there exists about the city for the future. I was in India for conference and the conference poster was this one. And I went around and asked, is this actually the future or the past you're showing here? And they said the future. And I said, oh, oh. Then I went to this UN habitat and they had just about the same future, but with six windmills. And also I've been to a number of places where I hear that when Norman, when we have the automatic cars, that will solve all the problems we ever had. This is a rendering by Ford about the future we are looking forward to. And I'm not looking forward to this particular future, which is pictured here. Other people say that whatever is left of problems, the drones and helicopters will solve those. When I look at a scene like this one, I'm not sure that the problems will be solved. We also hear that we, a number of people are working on gimmicks. We can give us a smart city. And then again, all our problems will be solved. What is common for all these things that it it needs a lot of investments. It will be only for the developed world for many, many years. And somebody is trying to sell a lot of stuff. And I think it's fine. Some of these things will really improve the situation. But I'm a little bit worried that we get too excited about being saved by all these gimmicks which are being developed. One of my colleagues one day looked into the, the Google um, to see what they said about future of cities. She came up with this one, which is a collection of all the suggestions for the future of cities. And when looking closely into this, I realize there's very few of these places I would look forward to raise my children or my grandchildren in or to be old in. I'm not sure that the future we describe as architects is really a very pleasant future. But anyway, it's in, the, it's in the future now we have today. And I will ask that while we are waiting for all these magical, expensive gimmicks to be developed, are there other meaningful things we can do just now? Yes, we could make people our first priority. But let's take a short look at the history, city planning in the 20th century, we can look at that, or we can call it how people were chased out of the cities. There were the good old days when everything was done by people, for people, they were done in human scale, with the human senses as a background, all the buildings were this kind of height which the technology could make, 
and people felt very comfortable in these surroundings. But then in the 20th century, we had two enormous earthquakes, two dominating planning paradigms. We had the arrival of the modernism, the Athens Charter in 1933, but it was only in the 1960s the modernism really was rolled out in the big scale in many, many parts of the world. The other big earthquake was the invasion of the motor car all over the world. And looking closely into what happened actually, before the modernism, the cities were made up of spaces. All the life of the cities were made, being made in spaces made by people for people. There were markets, there were processions, they were crowning the kings and they were, they were executing the criminals. Everything happened in the spaces. They fell in love and saw the other citizens. Everything happened in spaces. All the buildings of the city were talking to the spaces. Then with the modernism came a complete earthquake. Now it was not focused on the spaces. The city is now made up on objects. And whatever is not an object or built upon is left over space. In the old cities, we can always remember all the spaces, all the streets, all the squares, and maybe we can remember two, three important buildings, the cathedral, the town hall, the royal castle, whatever. In the new towns, we can remember no spaces because there are no spaces, but we can remember a number of funny buildings, which we as architects have made. They have the same content, but they look differently because it is like the perfume bottles in our bathroom, that every bottle has a different form, but the content is by and large the same. So by moving the focus from the spaces to the objects, we also set architecture free to do whatever they like to do with the shape to impress each other and the world at large. The result of this modernism was actually a goodbye to the concern for people and social life in cities. And another result being a complete confusion about what is a good scale for people. In the old days, it was very came, came natural because it was done on experiences from the past and handed over from one generation to the next. But suddenly, people are now floating in all these leftover lands where they don't feel at all comfortable. Also in the same period, that will be from 1960 onwards really came the car invasion in the big scale and it happened in all parts of the world at different times a little bit, but with the same result that the people were chased out of the urban environments. People were treated very badly in cities all over the world. And, and of course, especially in the developing countries, they, the conflict between the, the mobility and the people living their lives in the city was more and more obvious. These things happened. And then the result in many ways is that, oh no, is this what you mean by hell? Yes, it is. If we look at the year 1960, which I'm focusing on, because that was when these two earthquakes really was rolled out worldwide. What did we know about quality for people at that time? Virtually nothing. Then, of course, we heard the strong voice of Jane Jacobs from Greenwich Village in New York, where she was battling with Robert Moses about the trans Manhattan freeway and the high rise, which should come in instead of all the redundant old areas like Greenwich Village and Little Italy and Soho and Tribeca, whatever they are called. Luckily, Jane Jacobs and the other citizens won that fight. And we still see now Greenwich Village as one of the best 
areas in New York. And also we can remember what she said in her book from 61, that is if the modernists and the motorists are to plan the future cities, that will be the end of great cities and the start of the death of the cities. She's still very much alive though, she has passed away, but she's really the grandmother of humanistic city planning. This is a poster seen in Toronto a couple of years ago. Jesus looks after the end of times, but Jane Jacobs still looks after the future and her message was very strong. My own education happened at, at the heyday of all these things. I finished, I graduated in 1960. I was trained in the 50s. And what did we train in the 50s? We were training how to put little objects and make nice patterns and nice, um, we were treating cities like cakes. We were putting these patterns, these objects down until it was a nice pattern seen from the airplane. And then this was a good city. We were told also that it doesn't matter how you built because people are adaptable. They will adapt to anything. So the only thing that matters is that it looks good from the airplane or whatever. That was the way I was trained. And then I was so lucky that I married a psychologist and suddenly we had some other tunes in the house. The young psychologists, my wife and the other ones, they kept saying, why are you architects not interested in people? Why don't you, they teach you anything about people in school of architecture? That was very strong medicine for young architects. And I had to go back to architecture school and continue my study for 40 more years. The first thing of course, was to find out why didn't, wasn't I told first time I was in school of architecture. And of course we realized that we knew nothing about how architecture and city planning influenced the quality of life for people. We had to start on square one by studying and making the people visible, making visible to architects, to developers, to politicians, um, how we influence the life of people with our architecture. Um, my studies, which have been going on, of course, for more than 40 years, but after a number of years in 71, I published the very first one, which very characteristically from that period was called life between buildings, saying that the life outside the buildings were very valuable. And the way you put the building had a fantastic influence of whether there was life in the public spaces or whether they were lifeless. That was by and large the same subject as Jane Jacobs was addressing. It's now 50 years since this book came. And just yesterday I was working on the eighth version. It's come out in all these 50 years. It's come out in 30 different languages, much to my joy and of course to my surprise, but very little has actually been written about the influence of architect and city planning on the quality of people. Later on, I wrote several other books and the major one maybe was this one, Cities for People from 2010, in which I was asked by a foundation to put down everything I knew from my 40 years of research while I could still remember it. And we published this, and this is now all out in actually 39 languages all over the world. And it's not because it's a, it's a brilliant book, it's because I see, as I see it, that so little actually has been written and known about people in cities that the moment something is put together about this subject, the whole world is actually very, very hungry to have this information. That's why it can be spread so quickly. Seemingly, mature people are mostly interested in this subject. This is the Danish queen and the king of England. They are studying very eagerly. 
But if we are to sum up, we have now done more than 50 years of research. And I would say that though not too much has been made in this area, in this borderland between the social sciences and architecture and planning, I would say that we know now enough about how to make fine cities for people, starting with Jane Jacobs, and it's been going on now for 50 years. We know what to do. The problem is to have this knowledge used in real life so that it can come to the benefit of people worldwide. What we have learned in this research is certainly that it, it matters how you build. We form the cities, but then by God, the cities, they form us. They form the way we can live, the way we can move, the way we can interact with our community and our neighborhood. All this is highly influenced by the way we plan. And also in the details, we, we know now that we can make places which are so awful that the only thing which happened there is that people are galloping out of these spaces as fast they can. And we can also know a number of things we can do so that we'll have the opposite effect that people, when they come to this place, will feel tempted to stop, will feel tempted to sit down, will enjoy to spend some time to see what's going on, whatever. And they may even come from all over the city to go to this particular space because it is, it has all these qualities as opposed to the other one. We know that this difference that we can influence is about a factor of 10. There could be 10 times more life on the good square as opposed to the awful square. While all this research was being done, we see that a number of new challenges has emerged. And if you want, if you ask a, a mayor today, what is your policy? He will probably say, I want a li li lively, livable city. I need to have a sustainable city. The city should be healthy to live in, and it should be a good city to be old in. The first one about the lively and livable city has to do with the century old need for people to meet other people. We cannot live out of cyberspace so out of our lives. We need very much to also have access to public space, to see our fellow citizens face to face, to see what society we are part of, to see what school, what university we are going in, what neighborhood we are in, what society we are belonging to. So the greatest interest of homo sapiens throughout history has always been other people. And that's what public space can give us in a very quiet way that always was a big thing in cities. And if you say that's not a big thing anymore, just look at any of the presentation drawings which architects do when they present their projects to the client and to the city council. They are always crawling with people doing things which they are not likely to do in housing areas. But if it was an empty scene, everybody will be suspicious. What's wrong here? Why have they left the space? It could not be a nice place. When you see all these people, you realize at once that it must be a nice place or they would have gone home. So life and liveliness of places is still very much uh, asked for. The other thing which we must address today is we must have a sustainable city. We must do much more with the climate challenge. And that could be a number, that could be 10 lectures in itself. But I'll just say that the more we walk, the more we bicycle, and the more we use common transportation, public transportation, the better it will be for the climate. Sustainable city. This is a post I saw in Germany. Now, finally, I can drive the kids to climate demo in my electric shared car. To me, it's obvious that there are other and better things we can do for the climate than driving our kids to demo. Another thing we have to address today is the sitting syndrome. The doctors tell us constantly 
that for 50 years we made cities so that people are invited to sit, 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 and sit. But to have, to use your, your body is very important. You, if you just do an hour a day of moderate exercise, you can have seven extra years and much better quality of life. And furthermore, it will be much cheaper for society. So World Health Organization would say, introduce transport policies that promote active and safe methods of traveling, walking, and bicycling. So the doctors are strongly urging us to do more for people to walk and bicycle uh, and to move their own muscles when going around. There's another new challenge that is that we have in all our cities an increasingly number of elderly people, 20, 25%, and many of them will live for 15, 20, 25 years, and we'll put strong demands to the neighborhoods and to the cities for having a good life in their old days. I know, because I'm myself in that age group, that the doctors will say, you must walk as close to 10,000 steps a day to keep the doctor away. And that's a fair distance. And you need some very nice neighborhoods to be invited, to be tempted to do this much in the public spaces. If we put all these things together, if we look carefully after people in city planning, we will actually efficiently address these four issues. You will have a more livable city, more sustainable, more healthy, city and a good city to be old as well as young in. Then we can ask the question, are there cities today which are doing everything they can to invite people to walk and to bicycle as much as possible, not only in the weekend, but more importantly, in the course of the daily day do it. And I'm very happy to note that cities all over the world are now following more and more this idea that we shall use the power of the people, what we are main, meant for, what we were built for, that we shall use our muscles to get around, to meet each other, whatever. Uh, I could now take you to a number of cities I work with. Um, I could tell you about Melbourne, no end, to all the good things they made. Um, and then the Melbourne is so good now that it's by far the best city in the Southern Hemisphere. And if you don't know what to do, I can advise you move to Melbourne. Their streets now has an ambience and character, just like the streets in Paris, I would say. But the weather in Melbourne is considerably better. I could take you to Sydney, where they have this wonderful waterfront, but where there's been a hard work to make to get the, the traffic and the cars and the buses out of the, of the inner city and make the inner city city center for people instead of for endless numbers of cars. This has succeeded now um, to certain degrees and Main Street Sydney, which used to be an inferno of traffic, is now pedestrian street with a light rail going up and down. What happens? When you do all these awful things to a city and introduce, take the cars out, take the parking spaces out, make bicycle lanes and, and make a number of things to change the city from being very technocratic to being more people friendly. One would think that you would be stoned out of the city, but the opposite happens. You get the key for the city and I know a, nominated or given the, the title of honorary citizen. I could tell about New York, where in 2007, Michael Bloomberg came up with a plan New York for greener and greater New, New York. New York at that time was certainly not very people friendly. The bicycles were used to protect the parked cars. There were some posters floating around showing more or less about the conditions for bicycling in New York at that time. Uh, when this new plan came, 
the commissioners from New York came rushing over to Copenhagen to ask what was being done in Copenhagen to humanize the city. And they had a very good, great time in Copenhagen. And at the end, they said, we want a city like this one and invited us to come. And that did many things. But one of the things was that it resulted in Broadway uh, being closed at the intersections with the avenues and Times Square, Madison Square, Union Square, and, and Herald Square being moved from a traffic circus into a place for people. Also in New York, uh, they introduced bicycle system, put in a number of many, many kilometers of bicycle lanes and took away car parking or made narrow streets, did a lot of things. And what happens when you do all these awful thing like into a city like New York, you, by God, you get an award from the commissioner for your contribution to the public realm. Going now to the my hometown of Copenhagen, which has seen a fantastic development. It has made 60 years of people first policies and it's a fairly nice city to live in today, I can assure you. They were very early in 1962 to take the cars out of Main Street, Copenhagen. There was much discussion. It was generally believed that we were Danes and not Italians and it will never work to take the cars out. But next year, when there was room to be Italians, we saw definite tendencies for the Danes to behave in an Italian way or rather as homo sapiens. We, in Copenhagen, it was exactly like in all the other cities, but one by one by one, all the squares and many of the streets have been cleared of parking and traffic and given over to the life of the city and the citizens. What is characteristic and what one of the reasons why this has happened in Copenhagen is that we were one of the centers in the School of Architecture in Copenhagen to start to study what people use the city for. So we were able to document just as carefully as the traffic engineers documented the traffic, we were able to document the life of the city and to document that if you change the conditions, you could have more life, they could have more elderly people come, you could more children playing. We saw, we saw there was a close connection between what you do and what you get. We also say sometimes that what you count, you care for. And in all the cities of the world, they never counted the life of the city. They always counted the traffic. But now in Copenhagen, we started to have data about the life. And that meant that led to a very substantial change of the city because the city, the city politicians started to follow the good advice. There were in this period maybe three schools where the interrelationship between form and life was studied. That was in Berkeley, that was in New York with Jane Jacobs and Holly White and Project for Public Spaces. A number of prominent people were writing books in Berkeley. And then there was Copenhagen. What was different between this school of studying life in cities were that we did all our studies in our hometown of Copenhagen. And that meant to having an enormous influence on the city of Copenhagen. From 1962, we've seen a steady improvement of the city. More and more spaces are cleared of traffic and given over to people activities of various sorts. Copenhagen has two important strategies decided by the city council, we will be the best city in the world for people. We will also be the best city in the world for bicycling. And we've seen how all these sectors are more and more in, are increasing. Um, and one of the things was we've seen an impressive increase in the bicycle. Uh, now we have 49% using bicycle for commuting to the city as opposed to 10 years ago when it was 38%. So what we learned from Copenhagen is 
you get what you invite for. If you make more streets, you get more traffic. If you make better conditions for walking, for public life and for bicycling, you have more walking, more public life and more bicycling. That's what we have learned from Copenhagen. And that's why Copenhagen has become a much better city to live in for all generations. What happens when you do all these awful things to a city, taking cars out, taking lanes out, taking parking out? Your first assistant becomes the city architect to continue this people first policy, which Copenhagen has developed over the years. What happens when you do all these dramatic changes? You find that Copenhagen in 19, 2021, again, is on top of the list of the world's most livable cities. It's always been among, up and down, among the five best in this category in Monocle magazine. What happens when you do all these struggles? Oh, my dear, you may find your, your face on posters. You may find posters of yourself on the bus stops and the metro doors saying that you have contributed to the quality of this city. Amazing. So if we are talking about cities of the future and the dreams and worries, I can give you some advice. What not to do is Dubai. Dubai is modernism and motorism. It's very unsustainable and it's not very people friendly at all. Maybe you could do Venice. They have great neighborhoods for all generations, but the mobility system is a little bit lacking and there are shortcomings also in other ways in Venice, but it's a wonderful city in a nice scale. What I could suggest is that you take another look at the Copenhagen model, which is sort of a, a cross between that the cars should have access where it's necessary, but the people should also have a good say and there should be good knowledge about the, the life of the city, the public life in the city, walking, pricing and so on. We call it humanistic city planning and that is the planning where we put people first in the planning. Here the children are out training in the kindergarten to be a good citizen of Copenhagen. So my conclusion, people cities as a first priority, that is the simplest and cheapest you can do. All the other things I showed you in the beginning are very expensive, but this policy is very cheap. It creates better cities for everyone in society. And it is for cities in all parts of the world, regardless of economy. And you can all of you start to do more in this area tomorrow. I will end to welcome all of you to Copenhagen next summer. We actually will be hosting the International World Congress of Architects Union, the International Union of Architects Congress will happen in Copenhagen from 6th to 6th July next year. And we would like to see you all there. Be welcome. Thank you. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, thank you so, so very much. Um, we only have two minutes before we need to wrap up. And thank you, you kept it perfectly on time. Uh, and so I, there's a question in the Q&A uh, sec section, and I, uh, I will basically interpret it um, as follows. Uh, you are a professor emeritus, and so you, you understand the curriculum of, of the universities today. Do you feel the focus of most universities in Europe and the United States in general has the correct focus on urbanism? Or, or is it still in, in this um, infatuation with modernism and the car? I think that uh, the answer to this one is that the universities, the architecture school, are generally lacking much behind in this area. Of course, the modernism which set the architecture, architects free to do whatever they liked and put the focus on the objects was really fantastic 
message for the architects because now they could be architects and they could make funny shapes and focus could move from making a good fabric for the life of the city to making funny buildings. That is still very dominating in most schools of architecture. There are mm. exceptions, but generally I feel that we are still very much in the modernistic era where focus is on the objects, which of course for architects is the interesting stuff. No, no doubt about that. But I think that humanistic urbanism is the important stuff and more could be done to teach that. Okay, thank you. Um, do you. Is there any other question, Daniela, or anybody that wants to be asked? Daniela, can you help me? Otherwise, I have a question. Um, what do you see, if you could, since you've been studying so long the course of um, urbanism and the, and the path of cities, and you've seen those amazing transformations in the last 60 years, since the car, um, the triumph of the car, do you, what do you think, what do you see as the future of cities maybe in the next 50 years? Is it, is it an optimistic view or is it more of a, um, what's your view, um, viewpoint of cities in the next, I don't know, maybe you can choose the time frame, but in the, in the long term, the really long term. I think that uh, what is really complicated is to speculate about the long term. But I have a great optimism because all over the world, we have the same species living. It's a homo sapiens. We have the same heights, this, we move the same way, we have the same senses as we have always had. And we are very interested in social life, all of us. And I, I really trust that as we know more about how the built environment influence our lives, we will find good ways of integrating the best part of new technology so that we could have a better quality of life. And also we must realize that we might live much longer than today. So it's increasingly important that we have wonderful urban habitats where we can live our whole life from child to very old. I trust that this will be more prevalent in the future. Thank you, thank you. Daniela? Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really great. We do have one more question. Um, is there a future for private transport at all? Sorry? Is there, a is there a future for private transport at all? Do you, um, can you elaborate on that? Private transport. Certainly, um, but it, not to the extent we have become used to have it because there, there will be use for private transportation for elderly and for handicapped people and for services of various sorts. But many other types of transport can be done uh, on foot, on bicycle, or in public transportation, which could be much improved from the models we have today. Uh, it could be much, much more business class, if I could say it so so that it really could, in an efficient way, serve the citizens much better. We must realize that the idea of the motor car is 120 years old, when somebody got the idea, if everybody got a ton of steel and four rubber wheels, he could be mobile. And that was, of course, very smart in the Wild West, but it's not very smart in the million Million, million person cities we have today. So there are much smarter ways of getting around. The ideas of the 15 minute city could be something which would be very inspiring. Great, thank you. We have one more question. It's about um, how, do you, how do you see the abrupt growth in Latin America? And what is strategies do you recommend implementing uh, to address that issue? 
first of all, I will ask, are there homo sapiens living in Central America? Because then I think it's the same recipe as for homo sapiens in other parts of the world. Because we, we are the same species. And actually, we like the same things all over the world to an amazing degree. It's just we have been mistreated in various ways and have been led astray in various ways. But there are some very basic qualities which we can name for, also in Central America. And some of the cities there actually in, in Central and South America actually are doing some very interesting things like Curitiba, just to mention one. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any other questions I wanna uh, type up? Actually, I'm coming up here. Thank you very much uh, for being here with us today. Uh, it was great to see your example uh, how your theories got um, implemented in New York. I, I leave the city and I love uh, the fact that it's more uh, pedestrian uh, right now and especially during COVID. Uh, people enjoy more the outdoors here, something that was not a uh, very common, um, you know, like having restaurants with with tables outside and you know seeing who's walking through this the 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 sidewalks. And um, uh, my question is more oriented to New York City and how um, what would you consider is important to implement next in New York? Um, you know, you had certain sectors, but which other areas of New York you think that need um, immediate intervention? And what would you recommend in those specific cases? I will be so smart not to answer your question, because I do think that, uh, that urban design and urban planning is not that easy. That uh, I, I would, when I had the chance to go about for a week and think about it, I will come up with the answer uh, so that, that I know that it is a solid answer and not just something you say. There, of course, are many areas in New York which could be much improved, uh, which you and I know for sure, but where to start and what to do. I will also have to consult colleagues, commissioners, and ordinary people in various districts, really to answer your question. But I have seen cities fantastically turn around and become wonderful cities when they were awful cities. Maybe I could mention Melbourne, which was considered a lost case at the end of the previous century, and now is one of the nicest city in the Southern hemisphere. And as far as I can see, much nicer than any city I can think about in the United States. So it looks like a city in the United States, but when you move into it, it has many, many interesting people-friendly planning, uh, planning uh, dispositions, which makes it a very interesting and nice city. So we can learn a lot from each other and I would say that all problems of city planning are solved somewhere, that the trick really is to find out which of the problems are relevant for me and where can I find the solution. It is there. Well, I, I had the pleasure to be in Copenhagen for one day and that one day I use a bike and um, you know it was very easy to use and I loved it. And this is a long time ago. I had no idea who planned this, but I enjoyed it and it kept in my mind, it's easy to you know, uh, drive a bicycle around. Uh, from that time I was there until like I moved to New York, maybe past 10 years. And, and then, you know, New York was implementing the city bike and so on. And, and you get to, you know, um, find ways to um, use the bike by still, 
it, it for me is very dangerous to um, <laughs> drive the city yeah. bike in New York. I use the west side, the east side, the areas that are specifically for biking, but you know, crossing towns going from east to west in the bicycle still is a is a um, you know very difficult and not saying impossible. Uh, but we hope that um, those type of issues uh, get um, get fixed because it will be nicer to commute in a bicycle, as many many New Yorkers do now. Um, it's been increasing, but I don't know if the safety part was increased. You know, like more people want to um, use the bike for health issues. Uh, you know, like or for during COVID, especially. They don't want to use public transportation, as you said, like um, it's, it's easier to have the 15 minute uh, city. Uh, but, you know, um, sometimes on cities that are um, older, like New York, it's harder to implement in, in a short um, term. But, um, yeah, I would like to see as a New Yorker uh, how um, all these problems get solved. And as you said, the collaboration with others, you know, and try to see if um, our, um, you know, uh, representatives uh, get advice in, in this uh, regard to improve the city in the long term. Please note what I ended by saying, that next year you have the chance of the lifetime to go to Copenhagen with the Architects International Architects Conference. The whole city and the whole, everything will be about architecture and that will, everything will be shown to all of you as, as inspiration. So join us for the UIA conference next year. It will be fabulous. I know. What is the, the, um, the Second, schedule? Second to, sir, to sixth July. Like, okay. I See hope you to be able to bike. go. Yeah. I love it. All <laughs> the colleagues in New York and all over the States will come because I think you will be inspired. And that's exactly the role Copenhagen has had through these many years. It's been a little step forward in front of the other ones. And they've all come and said, oh, we want this to happen in our city. That's how all my work has started in these various cities that we they come and see and say, hey, this I could like to see in my city. Fantastic. And see you in um, Google next summer. A, a virtual um, part. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Eduardo, all yours. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been a very enriching and inspiring presentation. I thank you so much for your time. We not only have been inspired, but we have been reminded of the importance of making the right choices as architects when we're doing urbanism and architecture. Uh, and we've also been provided hope that if we do it right, as architects, we are creating these cities and, and these buildings. So if we make it right, we can go towards a better place. So thank you mm -hmm. so much. I appreciate it. You would be heroes of the society if you do it right. Thank Absolutely. you very much. And Being an architect is a great responsibility. Uh, listening to your presentation. It is. Well, thank you Goodbye. so much. We, we will continue with our presentation and thank you so much for your time. You're welcome.